Hello, I'm Lori Fazio from RJ Julia Booksellers in uh, Madison, Connecticut, as well as Middletown, Connecticut. And I am really excited to be here um, for the second week of the Book of Longings conversation with Sue Monkhead. I'm happy that you can all join us today and we're, we're not only gonna have some great conversation with Sue, but we're gonna be able to answer some questions um, that you all have put, put forth on some social media. Um, so welcome, Sue, and congratulations for another fabulous book. We are just thrilled to be a part of this. Well, thank you, Laurie. Um, I remember my time at RJ Julia's. Every time I've been there, it's been wonderful. So I'm so glad to talk to you today about it. Thank you. We, we were looking forward to having you come in person, um, yes. but obviously with everything going on, we'll, we'll take this definitely as a <laughs> you know, second choice thing. So, um, you know, we're very excited to be a part of it. So, you know, thank you to you and, and you know, your whole team for putting this together and including us. Um, so I thought that maybe we would start with um, a couple of questions and then we could get into uh, some of the fan questions, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah. And so my first question for you is um, how you really envisioned the marriage of Anna and Jesus. You know, when we think about Jesus and we think about his time, um, you know, we see him obviously as a, um, you know, a, sort of a singular person with, with his um, apostles, but we don't really think about him, you know, as, as married. So how did you come up with that and, and take off with that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the marriage part was um, easy for me only in this sense. I wanted more than anything for them to have a great love. I wanted it to be an uncommon love. And in a way, um, a human marriage, but also the best kind of marriage, if you know what I mean. Sure. So I was... I was wanting to, in a way, model something, I think, about marriage, what might be possible. You know, I have this thing about writing fiction is not just to show us how it is today. There goes my phone. Sorry about that. <laughs> Wait, hang on. <laughs> well, that was interesting. Sorry. <laughs> Um, where was I? Okay. I have this thing about wanting to show what is possible, not just what we, what is. Mm -hmm. And so I had some of that intention, I think, in writing about this marriage. I wanted um, to say, here's what's possible. What if a man and a woman in a marriage could bless one another's largeness? What would that be like? Mm. Um, what, it, what would it be like to um, have um, your husband or your partner say to you, um, I respect your choices. This is, or to say, I have, which Jesus did when Anna said to him, I, you know, I don't want to have children. Right. Even though he, I think he disagreed with her about it, his own choice, he respected what she said. Or what would it be like when um, Jesus and Anna have each have their private space mm -hmm. as well as their place where they come together? Mm -hmm. And um, I, my husband gave me for our wedding present 50 years ago <laughs> a, oh, wow. a piece three link chain in a little nice box. And I thought, Oh boy, I'm getting chain for a wedding gift. <laughs> and it was, he said with a note from, it was a Rilke poem actually. And he said that the center space is where we are connected and are, and have our union, but we each also have a separate link that is our solitudes. That's and so we, lovely. and that's what I had in mind when I wrote that part about Anna speaking of having her private space. So there are just lots of things about that marriage that um, I wanted to portray, but mostly that there was a lot of love in it. Mm -hmm. And I think I there was very, tenderness. There was tenderness and it was very um, accepting. And I think, you know, of the shortcomings on either side. And I think, you know, you mentioned that 
you know, she didn't want to have children. And he, even though he didn't necessarily agree or we feel that he didn't agree, he accepted that out of his love for her. And I think that that's so important. And, and the writing really shows that. And even her frustrations with him of, you know, when going away and traveling and, but that acceptance is always there and the playfulness around it um, was just, you know, really lovely to see. And, and, and now hearing, you know, where you began and 50 years of marriage, I, you know, I, it, it seems like you probably pulled from, from a lot of your own experiences of how, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you do. I think as a writer, you often lift memories and experiences you've had or people around you. But I like that you mentioned playfulness because I wanted that to be part of it too, the humor, the playfulness. And I'm remembering a couple of scenes that are probably my favorite Anna Jesus marriage scenes. One is when um, Anna gives him a haircut. Yes. So I thought that was a fun thing to do that they could be playful and they, and they were in their banter with one another, even though beneath it was this kind of tension going on. Mm -hmm. um, the other one was when they returned from their Passover visit and they came back into the compound in Nazareth and they, there was a custom of washing their feet and they had their feet together and Jesus nudges um, Anna's foot in a kind of private little intimate mm. moment. I mm. loved that too. Very so sweet. they were playful together and um, that's, that's an important aspect as well. But mm -hmm. those are kind of random thoughts about their marriage and how they yeah. related. And, you know, I, even though, you know, it takes place obviously at, at the time of Jesus, there were, there were things that you could also relate to in, in current day. And, and it's funny because the haircut thing, I, I think of all the people giving each other haircuts right now <laughs> with barbershops closed. Right. I couldn't help but think of that when I was reading that part. So um, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I also wanted to, you know, before we take, you know, go to some questions from fans, um, I wanted to ask about um, how you wrote about Mary. Um, you know, Mary has been, you know, depicted in, in many ways um, and there's a common view of her, but, but, I felt like we got a, a more personal view of her, um, the way you wrote about her. Like I, I felt, I think, a connection to her as a mother um, and as someone, you know, struggling to keep a, a family, like doing what they need to do. And, you know, they didn't all get along for, you know, everything. And, you know, she was very calm and peaceful. So how did you go about that? Did you have a vision of what you wanted her to be? Well, I have a theme for Mary. So if any of the, your book club readers out there, who, by the way, welcome, and I'm so glad you're here. Um, I have a theme for her. And if you have read maybe Traveling with Pomegranates, which is the um, memoir I co-authored with my daughter, Ann Kid Taylor, I talk about my kind of adopting Mary as a, a transcendent, even divine feminine image. And um, she's over my shoulder, if you can see her back there. My, yes. That's my Black Madonna. Um, so she's important to me in that sense because she, rep she represents something for me that is like muse, but also holds a lot of the divine feminine energy for me. But I had also wanted to write about her as just a woman, a human being. Mm. She's two, she has two aspects of her in the collective imagination and history. And so this was a treat for me to kind of, because I wrote about this one back here in The Secret Life of Bees. Right. So in this particular book, I wrote about her human side. So she had kind of gray hair, she, yeah. it was graying. You know, she's tired a lot. Um, she was a really good mother. Yes. Um, she didn't get a lot of credit for things. She's the one who taught him certain things like to turn the other cheek in my version of this. So she became ordinary, but extraordinary at the same time. 
She was an ally to Anna, which I very much wanted. Um, but she was, she, I just wanted to humanize everybody in this, all the characters. Yeah. And um, she was also kind of a, a buffer between Judith, the, the sister-in-law, yes. who was kind of an antagonist, well, not kind of, she was an antagonist sure, to, yes, she was. to Anna. Yes. Um, but yeah, Mary was um, an important figure in this book and became more so to Anna and was there for her. And when Anna gave birth, she picked three women, she called them her, her, her trinity, yes. to be there. And Mary was one of them. Of course, Yaltha was there. And then S Salome. Yes, yes. She's very relatable. And I, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, that part of it, you know, being a mom myself. And um, I really enjoyed how you brought that humanness to her. Um, the calming sense of, the, of the, the household, but yet speaking her mind as well um, in, a, in a very loving way, supportive way, but direct in her own way. So that was, I, I really enjoyed reading, you know, you, you brought her to the pages. It was great. Um, so shall we, shall we answer some questions from fans? Yes, indeed. Okay. I'm excited okay. for this. Reading glasses on here so I can <laughs> get these right. Um, so the first one um, comes from an Instagram uh, post and it's um, at Carissa Stein. And she asks, um, how do we as women embrace our longings and our wholeness in the midst of being a mother to little ones and having a husband who is supportive, but who still at the end of the day is the one who makes the money. Thus, I feel still leaves me with little room to move and explore when so much what I love doesn't make a moment right now. So, you know, I'm going to summarize a little bit of what she, what I think she means is, you know, we, we are, women hold, you know, the motherhood, a wife, and yet you need to be an individual um, or many of us feel that way. I mean, I know I do. <clears throat> and so how do you think that that plays into um, to the book? Yeah. Well, that is a powerfully important question. It's Clarissa, right? Yes. Um, and I think it is really a common question. The most frequent question I got when I wrote The Dance of the Dissident Daughter was about a similar thing, which was about <clears throat> if I take this journey, what about my husband and if he doesn't approve? Um, and I remember saying something like, well, we have to give him time too because we rearrange the furniture kind of like, they wake up the next morning and all the furniture's rearranged in the house and they're bumping all into it. So there is something about time. And I think some of that sort of applies here where we, you know, we have to open the dialogue and we have to sort of give time. But I remember my daughter, <clears throat> when she had um, my grandson um, and he was little, she's a writer and she very much felt um, out of sorts in a, almost identical way to the, this question. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I had forgotten this, but she reminded me not long ago that um, we talked about it. And, I, and she was worried about making, she didn't make any money, she's home with the child, and she didn't feel obligated to, you know, to go to the spa with some of the money because she didn't earn it. And I just remember saying to her, look, his money's your money. You know, you've got to value yourself and give yourself permission to know that what you do is valuable. And you have both of you have products at the end of the day. His happens to be a paycheck and yours happens to be raising a fabulous human being into the world. Right. And both of these things are valuable. And so, you know, it, for I think for her, it was largely about um, just owning that yeah. but every marriage is different and it's a touchy thing and I can't really say how somebody needs to 
explain that to their husband. This husband in this instance sounds supportive of her, but yes. perhaps trying to get used to something. And she sounds as if, you know, she wants to pursue her own largeness, which is so understandable because it's so important in our lives to be able to have a way to express that and to get in touch with that. That's where our bliss is. Mm -hmm. And so it, how do you make room for that when you are <laughs> got little ones? Oh, it's hard. Yeah. And when I was writing, starting to write, I had two toddlers. Um, I remember a five-year-old and a two-year-old. Oh, wow. It was an interrupted process all day long. And for a while, I made the mistake of saying, you know, when I can just get them everything quiet and I have time, I'll do this. But that never happens, I realized. <laughs> so I had to learn how to write <clears throat> hip deep in the chaos yeah. and that is not a perfect answer there really isn't one for this yeah the other thing i would say to a mother who wants time say for their art or their books or whatever is just remember that you are being yalfa to those children and that is an amazing thing that you are blessing the largeness of your children mm -hmm. and that is a gift too and sure. you need someone to bless your largeness and um maybe there is someone who can do that even if your husband can't like your mom or your sister or your friend um there's just it's just such a big complex area for women and we have not worked all that out yet right um, but I think we just keep trying. And I had some frustrating years, I'll tell you, with trying to write with, with little ones. And I would um, be conflicted inside. And I would do it with um, write, get up, you know, deal with something, come back, write. I learned how to do it in, in phases. So you mm -hmm. just work around it and know that it's temporary. and. And in the meantime, just savor them as the best I got. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds pretty good. And it, it, it's, a, it's a balance, I think. And yeah, it's hard. Right, it's, not, it's not easy. It, yeah. It's really not easy. And I love that she says that she and her husband are talking a lot about it. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. you know, step number one. And, you know, the fact that they're speaking about it and trying to work it out, you know, they'll, they'll figure it out. And, I, you know, that's, that's a yeah. good thing. Um, so the next one, um, also on Instagram, comes from Amanda C. Rice, and she says, I'm wondering how writing of Jesus and Anna's relationship might have changed your relationship with Jesus. So a little different than we talked about their marriage. And that's, that's an interesting question. It is. Um, it definitely had uh, an impact on how I saw Jesus and understood him and felt about it all. I didn't expect that. Um, you know, I grew up conventionally religious in church, the Baptist church, because I'm from the South, you know, and I had a concept of Jesus from that religious upbringing, but it was mostly the Christ aspect of Jesus, which by that I mean, <clears throat> Christ literally means the anointed one. That's who, who Jesus became, and that's the Son of God. That's the divine Jesus. So that's the one I knew and related to. But this time around, I wanted to portray the human Jesus. Mm. What, what about Jesus is, have we lost touch with? Well, it seemed to me it was his humanity. It had been eclipsed in a way by um, our feelings about him as the son of God and his divinity had just kind of taken over, mm -hmm. which, you know, is great. <laughs> but um, when we lose touch with the humanness of Jesus, we lose touch with our own potential as human beings. Mm. So um, it was the pre-Easter Jesus I wanted to write about. 
Hmm. And the one that was flesh and blood. And um, so that was how it started for me. And I just kind of fell in love with that Jesus. And um, I have a stronger feeling about him now. It was like meeting Jesus again for the Hmm. first time. And that is the title of a very significant book that I used in my research by Marcus Borg. If you are curious about reading uh, about the historical Jesus. So it was influential for me, but it was like that kind of meeting. And I have had lots of readers say to me that they kind of fell in love with this human Jesus again. Mm. So sometimes a figure like that, which is, you know, probably the most known written about figure on the planet, maybe ever, um, you really have to rediscover sometimes. Yeah. And how great to, to have a, another chance to do that. I mean, like discovering something new all over again. That's, that's yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, okay. So, uh, Dallas at Dallas dream lovey. I am also curious why or how it was Anna who came through for you as the wife of Jesus. Um, I'm wondering if in the back of her mind, she's wondering why it wasn't Mary Magdalene. A lot of Mm -hmm. people ask me that. Mm -hmm. Um, Why Anna? Because for, there are just several reasons here. Because I wanted a clean slate. Um, I needed to have a, a character that had no perceptions, no preconceived notions about that I could just create. Mm -hmm. And they did not have an ideas about her already that that's kind of a novelist prerogative, I guess. But also I wanted to talk about the younger uh, aspects of Jesus life when he, before his ministry, the unknown years, between the time he's an adolescent up until his public ministry began. Mm -hmm. I included a few, maybe two or three events that that actually happened in scenes in the book from the time of his public ministry, one at the beginning and one at the end. Otherwise, I didn't go there. Um, Because I wanted to think about his, um, what was he like at 21? at 22, at 19. Mm. And that's a picture we've never really had, in, I guess. So if that's the case, then his wife would have been younger. You know, she would have been 14 or 15 in that time. And men married, basically Jewish men in the first century in Galilee married around the age of 20, although it varied a little bit, but if you weren't married by 20, you were, you know, your family started raising their eyebrows a little bit. Marriage was a very important thing to take your place in the world and in the community. So it was around that time. I guess I thought if Jesus ever really had a wife, which I reiterate I don't know. (laughs) No one knows. Although I hope they dig up those, you know, evidence one day. Mm. Um, If, if he did, I suspect it would have been an early marriage like that. He would have been around 20, 21. Mm -hmm. She would have been adolescent and she probably would have died in childbirth because half the women did. The mortality rate was extraordinary. That's just a, an absolute theory uh, mm. that has probably only common sense behind it. <laughs> but, you know, those were some of my thoughts of why Anna. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, Francesca, Franny, 10 UTA. Uh, Sue, did you have a timeline of the Bible stories laid out first? And then you determined which ones to include. She finds herself pausing often to take it all in and mm-hmm. can relate to this because I, and even, you know, in, in the first part, 
you know, when we're introduced to some of the names and, you know, Judas and, you know, so I, I found myself pausing and reflecting on some of the stories and whether they were added in here or not. So I, that, how did you, how'd you do that? I didn't actually have a list. Um, I wanted, one of my intentions was to include some, what can we call it? Sort of like a preliminary um, way that Jesus might have known about something that he included later in his public ministry, like the parable of the Good Samaritan, yeah. which I foreshadowed, I guess, with this um, experience with Tabitha or Tabitha. It was the stoning of, that was in part one that I put in. It just came to me in the moment. I didn't really have a list, but I looked for these opportunities to insert something that would suge be suggestive of um, maybe some more familiar Bible story we might know. I'm trying to think of others. I mean, obviously, um, oh, the lilies. Yeah. yeah. Consider the lilies. Is, yeah. yeah, that was always one of my favorite uh, verses in the Bible when I was a kid for some reason. So the lilies had to be in there. Mm. And so Jesus was always saying, consider the lilies. It became a kind of little banter between them at times. So there were, I, I wish I did have him written down. I'll have to do that <laughs> after the fact and see what uh, references to Bible stories or parables uh, are really in there. But those are a few that kind of come to mind. Mm. I like how they, they popped up, you know, even, even when you're on, you know, not expecting it. And then you're like, Oh yeah, it makes so much sense. You, know, mm -hmm. you can picture yourself, you know, there and, um, yeah, I wanted it to be sort of like, oh, that's where he got that from. You know? <laughs> it was. It really was. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, um, this is Catherine Budig, which um, it sounds like she talked, you know, maybe she was uh, at a place where she was able to speak with you. She said, it was such a pleasure talking with you today at Kate Fagan 3 and I are basking in the oh. Dumon Kid afterglow. And she said she forgot to ask you if you could recommend only one of your books as the next read after Book of Longing. What would it be? Yes, I did speak with her just two days ago, maybe, on a podcast called Free Cookies. Yes. Um, well, what would it be? Well, I'm going to say if you want a book that has maybe some motif of this book, The Mermaid Chair. That is the no a novel about the um, a midlife marriage mm -hmm. in which my main character, Jesse, falls in love with a Benedictine monk um, and how this crisis in her marriage and in her spiritual life, in her art creative life, kind of revolutionizes everything for her. It's a bit of a cautionary tale. I don't recommend what she did, but it was a powerful experience for my character because it allowed her to belong to herself. That's how I see that story. So maybe the mermaid chair, although this is like picking between your children. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine, I mean, come on, let's see. Um, I mean, I'm tempted to say, um, the Dance of the Dissident Daughter, because it's a memoir, or Traveling with Pomegranates, they're both memoirs that parallel. I think if you read them, you would go, oh, all of that stuff is in her novel, The Book of Longings. In fact, I'll give you a concrete example of that. There's a dream in The Book of Longings, maybe you remember it, in which Anna dreams that she gives birth to herself. Yes. And it's uh, very significant. This has to do with her mothering. Is she, what is she going to mother? Is it going to be children or is it going to be something else? Mm -hmm. And she goes to sleep and has this dream. And in the dream, she gives birth to a girl and, the, and she lifts the child up and, oh, 
it's herself. She has okay. given birth to herself. Well, this it was absolutely almost word for word a dream I had and wrote about in The Dance of the Dissonant Daughter. Mm. It was pivotal for me. And I think many women who are beginning to find their largeness and their selfhood and their bravery have a dream or an experience like that in which they understand they must give birth to themselves again. And Jesus' comment about it was, oh, you're going to be born again, um, which maybe that's where he got that. So, yeah, maybe those two memoirs. See, you got me recommending all my books now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I second that. I, I think you just have to go down and read them all. So, <laughs> yeah. If you haven't read them all. So I think we have time for maybe, you know, one or two more questions. So we'll, maybe I'll switch to some Facebook questions at this point. Um, so Jan Clarson King says, what was your thinking about Anna becoming pregnant and then losing Susana? I don't know if I'm saying that the way you envisioned it, but that's how I read it, Susana. Um, I have oh. loved the image of the pregnant Mary in a very universal sense person willing to give birth to something, to care, to nurture, to love, to be patient, to listen to the life within, and to have the courage to bring it forth. Yeah. Well, my thinking about that is, it was an entry for me in the story to talk about this whole concept of mothering what is beyond children which is significant for women. There are some women who choose not to have children. There are women who at menopause realize they can't, that door closed. And what they, what are they going to mother? You know, it's, um, or later in life when their children leave home, what are you going to mother? We still have this kind of powerful nurturing instinct. And it's really a metaphor. I mean, we could use other language, but I think women, have this um, innate desire to birth something and send it out there. So that was the why I included this birth. Mm -hmm. And I had Anna love this child, even though she says, I was, I'm not a woman who wants to have children. She still, once she had that baby, loved that baby and, and yes. thought of having another one. But, Ultimately, she understood that this was not her destiny to do that. Yeah. Um, having the child die was, was crushing, <laughs> but um, that seemed very plausible because most children did die, as I was mentioning, the mortality rate. Mm. Um, and it was a way to talk about that grief and that conflict of whether to what she's going to do now with her life. Mm -hmm. And she came to understand that she chose to mother her, her voice in the world in her writing of lost stories. Mm -hmm. And I think those things are valuable. I mean, they're not exactly human children, but um, they are gifts and something we can send out into the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I wish, I wish we could get to all of them, but I'll, I'll ask one more, also from Facebook. Um, and it says, um, I'm, this is from Susan Ann. And she says, I was curious why you chose not to give Anna knowledge of any of Jesus's miracles. <clears throat> I think in a way, I may have addressed this already, and it has to do with my approach to writing his humanness. I wanted to write him without the miracles, without mm -hmm. the divine birth at the beginning, um, without the resurrection. Those are aspects of his Christ nature that were um, put into the scriptures some, let's see, decades after his death. Mm -hmm as he developed into this figure and that at least that's how I see it. And so I wanted to speak to how he would be as, as this um, man, this Jewish mm. man who lived. And I think, again, I'll just reiterate this. There was such a, 
I mean, there was such an extraordinary way of his ability to just be a human being in the world that I think it could inspire people to go, wow, if he can do that as a human being, what could I do? Is that possible for me? Mm-hmm. So that had that, those kind of things in mind. And I'll say this too. Um, I wanted this to be Anna's book. I wanted her to be front and center and it's her story. And he, um, you know, he's important figure in, in her life and in the story. But I purposely did not portray his ministry and his divinity because I wanted her to have her passion, her magnitude, her life and her journey and quest to Mm -hmm. not be overshadowed by his. That makes total sense. And, you know, when I was reading it, even when he talks about how he was cast out, you know, and are you Joseph's son? Are you, you know, and and he he doesn't talk about, like you said, the, the divine birth. And I wondered if there would be more to come from it of that story, but it always brought you back to, to Anna. So I, I, it makes total sense what you're saying. And it is, it's her longings, right? The, the book of longings. So I think that that's, um, you know, I um, just thought of something I wish I had mentioned when we were talking about their marriage earlier. Uh, There's just so much to say about it. There's a red thread in this story. Yes. And I saw one question on, I can't, on the comment page, probably on Instagram that asked about this red thread. And I thought, yes. oh yeah, I love the question. So I'm going to quickly just say something about it because it dovetails into the marriage question. Um, that red thread came to me because, well, back to dissident daughter, it's in there again. I pulled a lot of things out of there. And it has to do with the myth of Ariadne. And this thread, she followed. Mm-hmm. I, um, I just love the idea of having a life thread that resides in us, that is this sort of authentic voice in us, you know, and that we follow it through our lives. So it was kind of that, but it came to mean for her uh, the relation to represent the relationship she had with Jesus. And when it became worn and frayed, yes, that was a kind of foreshadowing of their separation and ultimately um, parting. Mm-hmm. So um, the thread was just one of those symbols that I put in the book and kind of like the incantation bowl. And, you know, it's interesting. A woman wrote to me yesterday and about the book and she had a red thread in the in the letter for me and i i love that i meant to actually wear it today and i i forgot Mm -hmm. um so i'll just mention so that that question did come from andrea um at Mm -hmm. adl dresses so i just since you brought up i wanted to make sure we acknowledged andrea (laughs) um so i think um you know, we're at, we're, we're near the end here. Um, I want to remind uh, all of the fans and followers out there that week three starts on Sunday the 17th. And um, the full details are on the bookoflongings.com. You could also go to the Facebook page. Um, and before, before I, you know, we do sign up, I mean, readers can definitely purchase um, copies at rjjulia.com or you can call us at the store. And we are fortunate to have signed book plates. So that's always thrilling. So thank you for doing that for us. Um, but as we move into part three, is there anything that you know, you're, you want to you know, give a little foreshadowing of everybody or shall they just read on? Um, well, I'll, I'll say this, that um, I don't think I have been able to express the way I want to just how much I love this book club and all of the engagement I'm seeing from readers. And I love reading your comments and your thoughts, particularly about the discussion questions and your, your comments about belonging and 
to one another and to yourself were so thought provoking again. I mean, just brilliant stuff. I loved it. And so thank you. I want to just thank you for being part of this uh, community that I'm feeling gather around this book and um, as we explore things in it. And I hope you keep talking to one another. Um, part three is a whole other adventure. <laughs> and I know that a lot of you have written to me say, in the comments saying that you've read it already. You've read the book and that's perfectly fine. You don't have to read on the schedule. Um, so you know what I'm talking about, but it takes um, Anna on a different trajectory in a way into a new world. And that was really fun to write. Um, and I had so much um, pleasure uh, researching ancient Egypt and Alexandria and tried so hard to get all of that historical background just right. Um, so I hope you enjoy talking about this aspect of the book too. We'll do that starting Sunday. We'll, if you're reading with the schedule, start reading and um, come up with your questions and your thoughts. Yes, how, exci how exciting. I know when I was reading the advanced copy, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan, as I mentioned earlier. And normally when I get my hands on an advanced copy of your books, I zip through it. And, you know, I don't know if you could see now, but I, I have it marked. <laughs> and notes and everything, which was, uh, which was also fun for me, that I, I, I got to slow down and really, particularly this part, since I was going to be in conversation with you, I got to really slow down and, and analyze it a little more. But um, you know, normally, I, like I said, I zip through and I just, I can't wait for the, for the next one, but we'll, we'll enjoy, we'll savor this one for a while. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So thank you again, Sue. Really, um, you know, it's an unbelievable book and it's, it's, you know, number one on the indie bestsellers, which is just so fabulous. And, uh, you know, thanks to these readers out there and to booksellers, I must say, I appreciate it very much. I mean, you, you all did this. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you again for including RJ Julia's and, and me as a part of this. Um, I've, in, I've enjoyed this and I look forward to seeing you in person Someday. Yes. <laughs> Stay well yes. in the meantime. All right. Readers, till next time.